So I'd like to thank everybody for coming along tonight. It's fantastic. We've got 24 participants, Sylvia. So uh, you're really a good draw for the club. And I want to thank you for this. I think this is the third year consecutive year that you've presented. Uh, you started off with conservation, and I think you did uh, fly time the second time, and today you're doing your special fly, the soggy bog. Uh, have you got your little doggy with you? Uh, he's out in the backyard, because oh. uh, he's, he's discovered my tying material, so okay. we're taking him home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sylvia, if you're ready, please uh, go ahead. Going on. So we're going we're gonna to tie the soggy bog today. Um, this is by far and away my favorite fly on the planet. Um, this is a fly I developed on the North Shore of Lake Superior uh, fishing for coastal brook trout. And it turned out to be probably the best fly I've ever fished for bass and muskie, done well on rainbows, browns. My biggest brook trout have all come on this. My biggest tigers have all come on this. Um, had a couple tigers just about pull my arms out of the my shoulder out of its socket, taking these flies. Um, crappy, um, bluegill, <laughs> um, it's done well in other words. Um, we've, we've, tried, we've tested on a myriad of species and it's always done really, really well. Always in the same size and always in the same colors. So I'm gonna walk you through this tie. It's not a short tie, um, it does take time. There's a lot of steps, but it's also an extremely durable fly. So um, the best I've seen so far is my husband took a couple of these on a muskie trip and he on a single fly, the same fly, landed three muskie and at least a half dozen bass before he ended the day and decided to take it off the line. So it's a durable fly. That's how I tie mine. It's no judgment. Some people like to tie, um, you know, quick flies, uh, tie multiples. Um, I tend to spend a lot more time on durability because I want to tie fewer and I don't want to keep changing flies. I want this fly to last a lot of teeth. That's my goal. Um, it's, an, it's a different sort of design. It's got that sort of matuka back here. I'll put it in the vise so you guys can see it up close. Um, the key to this fly is in the action. So let me put, there's the camera there. So the key to this fly really is the action it creates. So you've got this nice uh, life lag, like back, you've got the lateral line, which is always a, a nice um, attractor. The cone head gives it weight, which brings it down, but the deer hair collar, which if you have a look is only on the top, um, causes it to glide up in a very interesting motion when you pull the line, when you actually strip that fly. Uh, the orange throat, combined with the olive, are the natural attractor patterns and, and natural colors of bait fish that you would find in northern Ontario, which is why I use them. Um, you, you guys that know me know that when it comes to um, brook trout, it's all about olive and orange. Uh, orange is a natural uh, color that you find on uh, native species when they're spawning um, in brook trout waters. Orange can be effective with rainbow trout, but personally I find highlight colors, reds and pinks work better on rainbows, oranges uh, better on brooks. That being said, I still throw this for rainbows. So I'm gonna switch over to the fly cam now. Um, for hooks, what I'm using here is, uh, I gotta check, I'm using today a Daiichi 2220, size four. Uh, most of them, the, most of the ones that I tie are TMC 200, size two. So this is one size, there we go, one size down. Um, twos are probably my go-to. I'm tying a couple of fours because I've had a request for some smaller versions of it. It's not that much smaller. The one I showed you, I believe is a four. Um, I've never tied them smaller than that. Um, and like I said, 90% of the ones I'm fishing are a two. It's a big fly. I put a uh, quarter inch uh, brass cone head on that. Nothing earth shattering. Okay. so. We start like with every good fly, and I apologize, I'm working behind this iPhone here, so hopefully I don't hit it as I, as I work. With every good fly, you start with a nice, even thread base. Every, every millimeter of that um, hook shank should be covered in thread. This avoids material rolling over the shank of the hook as you tie it in. Now, when we get to the dubbing, um, I'm gonna be splitting thread, which is why I back spin my bobbin. I need my thread fibers to not coil up on me. I need them to lay flat, but this is not critical. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see it. I think you can see the difference. You see where I 
Let's see if I can point that out. See right there is where I back spun my thread to lay it flat. Do you see the difference between the threads? You got a couple knots there. That's the difference between um, working with flat thread um, and letting it coil up. And so it's not a problem to let it coil up and it's not a problem to tie with that. But if you plan on splitting your thread for any reason, whether it's for dubbing or for like a, um, a bunny collar or anything like that, you're going to need that thread to be flat. So I'm constantly back spinning my bobbin and that's just really out of, out of habit more than anything else. Okay, first uh, material in is the wire. Now, this is a hard one to uh, explain because it's kind of a large um, piece of wire and an interesting way to tie it in. So I'm going to take a long piece of, this is just medium copper wire, copper or gold will work um, as long as you've got some contrast. I'm gonna take double what I think I need for this fly and cut it off or break it off. There we go. So I've got this wire, this long piece of wire, probably more than I need right now, but I'm gonna double it over and create a loop. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's really simple. I've got both ends in my right hand and I've got the loop in my left. In my right hand, they're not exactly even. One is longer than the other. That's actually really important. It makes it more stable. I'm gonna tie this in by the ends of the wire onto the hook and I'm going to leave this loop out the back of the fly. Make sense? I'm getting nodding, this is good. Okay, switch cameras again. All right, so. I'm gonna lay my wire under the fly and I do um, tie it in the length of the fly. You don't have to. Um, I like it for durability and I do like that it makes the body even, not that you're gonna tell with the amount of dubbing we're about to put on it. So the next thing that you're going to do, and I'm gonna have to switch. This is, a, this is the only step I'll have to really switch back and forth on you guys. Take your hackle pliers or um, electrical hook or whatever you use to hang on to hackle, find this wire behind the camera, and you're gonna hook it onto the loop. And then you're gonna start spinning your wire. You're twisting the wire um, so that you get a ribbed effect. And we end up with two pieces of wire wrapped through the fly, which gives it more durability. If one snaps, I still got another one. Like I said, I want this fly to last a lot of teeth. I'm gonna go back so you guys can see what this twisting looks like. So just as I keep twisting, it just keeps getting tighter and tighter. You can over twist this, um, you can snap it. Kind of hard to do, but it has been done, but we're probably good there, that looks good. All right, I'm gonna put that in my material keeper and keep it out of the way. And I'm gonna bring my thread right back. Unfortunately, when I twist it, I brought the wire up a bit, so we'll fix that. Make sure your thread wraps are always super, super tight. There we go. And I'm gonna bring it a bit to the middle. I'm gonna backspin this bad boy because now we have to dub that very, very full body. So there's the body we're talking about. And there's a number of colors that I use for this. It doesn't really matter what color you're using. So this is a golden brown olive works, um, UV olive works well. Uh, the golden stone is a, is a favorite of mine as well. We'll use that today. It's nice and sparkly. But as long as you've got something that's all over brownish, a little bit darker in contrast to the, um, to the rabbit strip that's going on above. So you just, you wanna contrast those colors. I haven't seen any real benefits in color other than to say I've always kept them browns and olives. I uh, have used a peacock. UV peacock before um, ice stub and that works well as well. So again, as long as there's a contrast, it doesn't seem to really, really matter. All right, so we're gonna dub the entire length of this body with the exception of a small uh, portion uh, close to the cone where we are going to put in our, um, our, I can't even think, our deer hair collar, that's what we're putting in there. That's right, our deer hair collar. So I'm gonna just switch cameras here for a second while I prep my dubbing. Um, 
you can dub this in any way you want. You can dub direct onto the thread with wax. You can create a dubbing loop. You can split thread, however you'd like to do that. Whatever you're comfortable with, use the technique you're comfortable with. There's no wrong way to do this. Um, I, like I said, I personally prefer to split thread because I think it's easier for me. Um, my husband, who's one of the best tires I know, he swears by dubbing loops. I think everything on either side of this tying table is different. He uses whip finishers, I don't, you know, it's always opposite here, but that's okay. The flies all work and I'm happy to fish with his and he's happy to fish with mine. So you can't do this with every type of thread. So be careful what thread you're using. Um, this is a UTC Ultra Thread. Uh, this is 140 that I'm using. It is a streamer. You want to use a heavier gauge of thread. Um, you can see here that my thread's flat. Hopefully you can see that. Let's zoom in a little bit. Can you see that that thread is flat now? That's where you've got to start. So I've backspun the thread is flat. I know I've backspun enough because my bobbin isn't turning anymore when I let go. Right? You can backspin or you can let it go and go have a drink and come back. Um, either way, this has got to be flat. Once it's flat, um, actually before it's flat, you prepare your dubbing. So in this case, and this is where the synthetics are really helpful. I take my dubbing and I basically just roughly shape it, just pull it gently into this sort of long form that I'm going to use in my, in my split thread or my dubbing loop. The synthetics are really great. Try lobal ice dubbing. Although synthetics are really great for this, they're not going to fall apart. The natural fibers don't quite hold together as well as this. But this allows me to pick it up um, and put it in with one hand because I'm only going to have one hand to do this, right? Because I need to keep tension on my thread with the other hand. So flatten that out, get my bodkin, and I split that thread. And I'm just running the bodkin over it until I see it split and stick my... my uh, bodkin through that. So now I've got the bodkin running between the thread. I'd like to say it's half and half. It really isn't it, but it doesn't matter. You can see that, right? Okay. Now I'm going to use my left hand to hold that open. I'm going to place the dubbing. Like I said, I'm using smaller batches right now because the, the space I have down to the table is the limiting factor. And I'm going to place it between the two pieces of thread, the two sections of thread. And then I'm going to take the bobbin in my right hand and hold that. So now if I've done this right, I can let go and this isn't going anywhere. The, the dubbing is now sitting between those two sections of thread. My next move is to secure it in there and I do that by twisting. So I'm just spinning my bobbin and you can see it tightening right up. And you just keep spinning it, tighten right up. And you spin it until you get to a point where if you pull up and down, you have a little bit of spring. See that spring? So now we're at the right stage. This is the same, um, this is the same look I'm looking for in um, a dubbing loop. I still want that spring. So I know the fibers are locked in there well. Now you can take a dubbing comb, um, some Velcro, an eyebrow brush like this, whatever you find lying around, a bodkin, and you can uh, just tease that out a little bit. And look for some, look for the strays. You can always pull those out because they're coming out anyway, so that's okay. Um, you also have the time and ability to move this around, right? So there is some, there is some give so you can make this even. This is really handy if you want to make a tapered body. You can move the dubbing around and make it thinner, thicker and thinner in different sections. So now I'm going to unwind a couple of wraps and get this to the very back. I don't do this by the point of the hook because I've snapped more more sections of dubbing loop on the hook while spinning. Having that the tip of the hook nick the thread is just a deal breaker. Now, as I wrap, I'm gonna pull the fibers back on every wrap. If you're splitting thread at this stage, you cannot do it again. Now you've got a cut off a section of thread. So I take my thread, create like a dubbing loop, back to the hook, tie it off, make sure it's nice and secure. And I cut off this section of thread. If I let it go, you can see how it just coils up. That's the result of that spin, I've overspun that thread. Needed two for the dubbing, but this is gonna be 
unmanageable to split. So we cut a section of that off. You can see my bodkin is spinning again. It's got to take that, that spin out. And then we would do the second section of that. So at this point, if we did the whole thing, this is where I would start to tease out the body. Any questions so far? One. Go for it. It's about the cone. Does yes. it? Uh, does does the color of the cone matter? I uh, would I but uh, what do they call it? Gun metal? Would that work? I don't know. Or do you need um, the gold or the brass? I've always used gold. Okay. Always use gold. Um, because I think it's an attractor, but I can't say that that's true because I've never tried gunmetal. So I got to be honest about that. I don't know. Um, try it. Let me know. Thank you. Sylvia, so, I also had a question. You you had the two colors for contrast. Um, I would have expected you to say something like put the dark one on top and the lighter one underneath. Do you think that makes any difference? No. No, Just it doesn't. You've got really some, doesn't. Uh, some of the olive and the brown that's kind of a natural color. Yeah, the contrast is key. And, and, you know, I think a lot of it, so with this, with the pattern that I showed you guys that was complete, uh, let's go back here. Um, native species in Northern Ontario have olive backs typically. And so you can get some sort of orangey brassy bellies and white bellies. Now I've tried this in white, it works, but not as well. So I'm gonna do the, one of those magic things where I've got a, a fly fully dubbed here um, and we're going to head on to the next step. Okay, so on the fly, the next, uh, the next pieces that we need to look at are the throat, the lateral line and um, the back, the, the rabbit strip in itself. Then the last piece is that deer hair. So for the throat, I use uh, olive, uh, olive, orange marabou. It's definitely not olive, it's definitely orange marabou. Um, I'm using crystal flash pearl for the sides, for the lateral line. It really doesn't matter. I have used lateral scale. That is a great, great material. It doesn't produce more fish. I just, I love that material. Um, I've used different colors of crystal flash. It doesn't matter as long as there's some contrast for that lateral line. And as far as rabbit strip goes, any olive will do. I have a personal favorite and that's the olive gold variant is my personal favorite. Does it catch more fish? No. Well, I guess maybe yes, because I put it on the, on the line more. So other than that, it's not actually more productive fly by fly. All right, well, I've got no thread on this. Why didn't anybody tell me that? I did that magical step and didn't bother putting thread on. That's it's not magical at all. All right. Where were you guys on that one? Where was my help there? So I've got a piece of orange marabou here. I'm going to tie it in on the bottom of the fly. I'm going to do that by laying it where I want it to be, pinching it with my left hand. Looks a little long, I realize, but you're going to lose a lot of that visibility in the deer hair that gets spun on here, right? So I'm going to pinch it in place. Well, first thing I'm going to do is cut off some of this. So it's not in my way. Not the thread though. There we go. Get rid of it. Okay. I'm going to take the thread and I'm going to loop it up extremely loosely between, hold it between my fingers. And I'm going to do the same thing going down. And I only pull when the thread is down here. So right now there's no tension on the thread up here. The thread is just looped through my fingers and then I pull down. I'm going to do the same thing two or three more times. I loop that thread up and then pull down. The reason I do that is it helps to keep the uh, marabou from spinning. It's exactly where I want it. I'm gonna cut the rest of this marabou off. I really cut that off at an odd length. That did not help me out. I'm blaming the camera, just for the record. There we go. All right, so. Until this one, I was using an olive dubbing. It's a little bit different. And uh, I didn't mention, once I'm done dubbing this, I tend to stroke all the fibers down towards the bottom of the body. I don't need anything on top because we're gonna have that um, bunny strip on the top, that wrap strip on the top. Um, and I want all that bugginess from the dubbing coming down. So there's our throat. So we're gonna measure at the rabbit strip, the length of the body to, or the length of the fly to the bend of the hook is what we're looking for. 
I'm going to cut that off. And then to ease the tying process, I'm going to trim the top of it. So where the, where the fibers are, are um, sort of headed back, we want the, the fibers of the rabbit strip to go towards the back of the fly. I'm going to just cut a little point. point. Sylvia, sorry, one quick question. Yeah. You said uh, the, the rabbit strip is the length of the fly to the bend of the hook. Is that the leather or the full? The hook? leather. The leather. The leather. Okay. Thank you. So you can see the fibers extend beyond it. And I'm going to cut the other end of the point as well. Is this necessary? Probably not. Is it helpful? Probably not either. I don't know. It just makes me feel better. So I do it. So the end is, is cut to a point as well because it's, I don't know, I guess supposed to help it taper, but it's a step I do because I think it makes a difference. I have no proof that it does. So now I'm going to stick the point of the rabbit strip into the cone head. And sometimes I use a bodkin just to make sure she gets in there. There we go. This is interesting. All right. And again, a light loop and pull down, light loop and pull down. And I'm going to make sure that I'm really properly securing this because I'm going to be putting some, some good pressure on this. So that's secure. And now we're going to sorry, I keep hitting the camera here. Let's see if I can back this away a little bit, give myself a little bit of room. How are we doing? There we go. Okay. So wrapping the rabbit strip in place with the wire um is is kind of interesting there's the first step is really critical here to make sure you get a really nice tight rabbit strip along the back of the fly why is it important for this rabbit strip to be tight if this is just laying here it's very easy for a, a tooth to get in here and snap this when it's really really tightly bound it's much harder for something to get between the body and that rabbit strip and so i want to make sure this rabbit strip stays intact so to do that, I lay the rabbit strip down, pulling ever so slightly with my left hand. Then I take a bodkin and I separate, sorry, this camera is interesting. I separate the fibers using the bodkin. There they are. So there's my separation. That's where the wire is gonna go. Now that I've let, let go with my left hand, you can see how it's off kilter, right? It's not where my wire is. It's not where I separated it out. That's okay. It's gonna go back to that section or that, that area. I'm gonna loosely wrap the wire over just in place. It's just there. And then I'm going to tighten this up again with my left hand back into place. And I'm gonna let go with my right. And I'm gonna tighten that wire down again. So you see how nice and tight that gets, right? All right, so we're gonna do that again. And every time I wrap that wire through, I do it the same way. I get my knuckles in the way of the camera, uh, separate out the fibers. Seem to have lost some, there we go. And I loosely wrap that wire over. Let go of the fibers and then Pull it down nice and tight. You can always tease out that stuff as you go. Any questions while I'm doing this? There we go. There we go. Tie that off. Now I just break my wire, which is really easy to do when there's one piece, but now that there's two, I gotta wait for that double snap. Come on. Or use an old pair of scissors. That's your other option. All right. Sorry about that. All right, so all those pieces are in play. Now we've got our lateral line to put in. So like I said, about four times already, four pieces of crystal flash, apologies. We're gonna lay that down the side and they're uneven. So I'm just gonna even them out a little bit. 
They don't have to be perfectly even. It's actually preferred that they're not. You want them to be the length of the fly to the bend of the hook. I'm gonna lay them in place, hold them with your left hand. Loose wrap once, twice, and then tighten. Now, usually you just cut them off and then tie them in on the other side. I have a habit of migrating them over to the other side and then tying them off. Um, either way, it doesn't really matter, whatever works for you. Check the other side there and snip off the excess. Oops, sorry. All right. So there's our fly. Looks like they're everywhere. Once we get that deer hair collar on though, they'll be in place. This is the fun part. This is the part where you clear your tying bench, you clear the room, put everything away, get the dog in a different room, get the cat in a different room, get a vacuum ready. Or as someone said in my last time session, rent a hotel room to do this. It's messy, <laughs> but it's very satisfying at the same time. So deer hair, I'm using um, body hair. So this isn't bucktail. This isn't the kind of deer hair that you, you don't want to use deer hair that spins. So deer hair that spins tends to have a very hollow shaft. And so as, as you um, compress the shaft and tying it, it moves around a lot more. These are thinner fibers than that, the body hair. Um, and I, you know, you can look for different pieces and um, I don't think I could show you right now. These are sort of different thicknesses. This is the one patch I've been working on that is my absolute favorite and I haven't found anything as good yet. Um, but you'll find it doesn't, it doesn't splay quite, it will splay, but not as much as some other deer hair. Um, so have a look when you're buying deer hair. Um, if you're at a fly shop, open up the packages, have a look and see which ones have fibers that are thinner. I'll show you what this looks like on the camera here. So these are very, very thin individual hairs that we're looking at. And that's what you're looking for for this. Can you use other deer hair? You absolutely can. This is just easier to use. So I'm going to uh, cut off a section um, where they say about the width of a pencil, and that's probably what it is. Um, there we go. And then I'm going to take a comb and I'm going to take out that under fur. That under fur, fur is extremely important to remove. There's a lot of it. It's uh, very thin. It's very um, wispy. Get that all pulled out. Now we're going to get our handy dandy uh, hair stacker because we want to line up the tips. Put that on the table. I know you guys are missing the magic of a hair stacker tapping on the table. Apologies. And once we've got all those lined up, we put them in place on where we want the collar to be. Now, to tie this in, you want to place the deer hair. If you were looking at, let me do this another way. How can I do this? If you're looking at the fly head on, let's do this. We're doing it. All right, you're looking at the fly head on. You want to place the fibers here, not on top, kind of uh, 10 o'clock, let's say. That's where you want to place them. They're going to move when you tie them in place. So placing them here will have them end up in, at, at a center position. Hopefully that makes sense. And that's what I'm going to attempt to do now that I've been moving everything around and have all kinds of deer hair everywhere. Okay, so I'm going to put them in place. I'm going to wrap very loosely three times and then I'm going to pull straight down and slowly let go with my left hand. Once or twice through the butt ends and around the collar, around the comb. So hopefully now when I show this head on, we should only have deer hair fibers on the top half of the hook. Do we have success? I believe we do. All right. 
So now we've got to put the second half, the deer hair fibers on the bottom of the hook. Um, if you don't, your, your buoyancy isn't equal. So you want to select the exact same amount of deer hair or as close to as you can. So I've got another section in my hand here. I'm going to comb out that under fur, that really light stuff that we saw earlier. You can see it there. To make my life a little bit easier, I cut the tips off these just so I know where my collar is. And I'm going to place it in the opposite quadrant of where I started. So if, if those first fibers were at 10 o'clock, these are going to be at 4, 4.30. Now, these wraps are a little bit more challenging. I've got the deer hair in place. I'm going to bring the thread up, very loosely zigzag it through the butt ends of the top section. And I'm going to do that hopefully three times on that thread. There we go. Three times. Not always zigzagging through the same section. And now I'm going to pull down just like I did on the last one, very, very slowly. Bring my bobbin back up. Oh, and we have a problem. So something is snapped. So this is all coming off now. All right, that's not working. One, two, three. We've got to do that again. Sorry, Sylvia, I missed it. What was the issue? Um, the thread snagged on, on some of the deer hair. Oh, snagged. Okay. Yeah. And so it wasn't actually, um, it didn't slide through. So I'm expecting that thread, those two to three loops of thread to slide through when I tighten them up and keep everything in place. So I'm gonna do this again, take some more deer hair. And this isn't even messy part. Wait till we get to the messy part. Okay, cleaning out the, the uh, under fur. And this does happen. I mean, you're not always gonna have a perfect, a perfect tie. I'm sure in tying dry flies, you've lost some hackles or it happens. Okay, put those in place again. One, two, I'm gonna do two this time just to make sure I don't have any snags. Oh, she rotated on me. Not having a good deer hair day. So once I get them in place, I pull all the fibers back. I squeeze it down with my fingers and pull my thread very gently. You don't want to snap the thread. You can snap the thread, absolutely. So now it's good and tight. Notice there's no movement now. None of that, that uh, deer hair is moving. And so now I bring my thread forward. Get a couple more pinches and pulls. And we're all tied in good and tight. Now I would finish this. You use a whip finisher, by all means, a whip finishing tool, do so. Now comes the messy part. So, uh, razor blades. The tool <laughs> of choice for cutting up deer hair. Okay, I've got to move a few things here because once this gets in your dubbing, forget it. Once it gets in your, it's, it's really, really worthwhile to make sure your materials are put away before you do this. Because once you get deer hair in dubbing, you get it in marabou good luck. I mean, it's beneficial. I've done it on purpose to have uh, deer hair in marabou or in, um, oops, there we go. To have deer hair in dubbing can be really, um, can really, a really nice effect, but it's not quite what we're going for here. So uh, I've got all my critical materials away. All right. So now we take out a uh, razor blades. I always keep a good stock of razor blades on hand. Um, put on some eye protection because this is going to be interesting. I take the razor blade and I bend it. And I use that to cut off the deer hair. And it's that curve that gives me the nice even head. So 
See that? And I make sure that I'm following the angle of the cone head. So I'm not, I'm not running the blade directly into the fly. I'm following the angle of the cone head so that I have a nice taper. See what I mean? Now, typically what I do here is I'll tie all the flies up to this point or up to the deer hair, and then I clear my tying bench and I do nothing but deer hair. So you work your way till you hit the natural tips and you leave that, that part of the collar. Except on the bottom, you keep going. You don't, this is critical now, you don't wanna make sure you don't uh, cut off that marabou. When you get close, you can always uh, switch to, if I can find them, fine point scissors. I press the marabou back and slide up. And I can get the, the deer hair that way. Was your, comment a moment, was your comment a moment ago, Sylvia, that you tie a bunch, if you're tying a bunch of them, you would do the deer hair as the final step together? Yeah, I'll, I'll, tie, I'll tie all the bodies up to the deer hair, and then I clean up my tying bench, put everything away, get the vacuum out, and then I start doing deer hair. So you can see it's starting to come, come together. Um, at this point, I'd probably take it off the vise and just, you know, do a little bit of a haircut with uh, fine scissors closer to me than this fly is right now. <laughs> um, but you get the gist of it. And where's the, somehow I moved the actual fly I had, so the completed fly, yeah, it's somewhere here. I moved everything, goodness. There he is. So you can see how I trim to the side. Um, the deer hair goes down, the natural fibers go down to the lateral line around at or just above the lateral line um, on both sides. Um, bottom is clear of deer hair, just the trimmed section um, to level out the buoyancy. And that's pretty much it. That's the beast with cut deer hair all over it. <laughs> Sylvia, you know, this has been one of the most uh, clear, concise presentations we've had in a long time. Um, and uh, I think you've done a super job. And what I really like is that you described some of the errors that we can make and how to correct them, which is really important. Uh, so, Sylvia, I really, really want to thank you for tonight. It's been fantastic. And I think everybody agrees. Okay. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. it.